This podcast is brought to you by Art in Yorkshire, supported by Tate 2011. Sarah Brown, Curator of Exhibitions at Leeds Art Gallery. Artists must continue the conquest of new territory and new taboos. So said Norman Rosenthal, the curator of the notorious Sensation Exhibition held at the Royal Academy in 1997. Whether you believe that art reflects society or defines it, the theme of controversy runs throughout our visual culture. Going back to the beginning of history of art, we find cases of both individual artists and groups who have shaken the establishment and then become the establishment. It may be that you believe modernism began in 1907 when Picasso presented the painting Les Damoiselles d'Avignon. At the time, it sent shockwaves through the cultured classes because it was influenced by non-European art and challenged the status quo of acceptable painting at the time. It is now firmly part of the collection in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Or was it in 1917 when the Dadaist artist Marcel Duchamp created his best-known work, Fountain? A urinal signed with one of his pseudonyms under which he worked, it is often cited as the first work of art made from something that already exists. Now known as a ready-made, it is often seen as the starting point of the debate as to whether objects like it can be a work of art or not, and that debate continues to this day. Given that the history of art in the 20th century is in part defined by a non-traditional use of materials, it seems curious that such an innocuous work as Duchamp's can incite the most controversy. The international, although by no means universal, appeal of art is mirrored in its ability to provoke controversy the world over. Significantly, the catalysts for outrage and censorship are culturally specific and a work that might be interpreted as controversial in one culture does not have the same meaning in another context. The international, although by no means universal, appeal of art is mirrored by its ability to provoke controversy the world over. Significantly, the catalysts for outrage and censorship are culturally specific, and a work that might be interpreted as controversial in one culture does not have the same meaning in another context. When the now legendary 1997 Sensation Exhibition was shown in London, it was Marcus Harvey's painting of Myra Hindley that sparked a dramatic response. But in the same exhibition in New York, it went unnoticed, and instead, Chris Ophelia's painting was branded blasphemous. There were even threats of cutting government funding to the Brooklyn Museum that was hosting the show. The following four artists, all of whom feature in the Art in Yorkshire Supported by Tate programme, are no strangers to controversy. All of them have made work which intentionally or unintentionally has caused an outcry of opposition from the general public. My name's Sarah Burnage. I'm a research curator at York Art Gallery and I'll be talking about William Etty. Born in York in 1787, William Etty was one of the most prolific and successful artists working in the first half of the 19th century. During his 40-year career, he produced a wide range of works, including large-scale historical canvases, delicate cabinet pieces, as well as numerous evocative portraits. However, the artist is perhaps most famous today for his repeated and sustained use of the female nude in his art. Indeed, in a period which has traditionally been defined by notions of Victorian prudery, Etty's art stands as a testament to a very different set of moral values. Etty was considered to be a stalwart of the Royal Academy and an inspiration to the generation of artists who were to precede him. However, his repeated use of the nude, in particular the female nude, sharply divided public opinion. Indeed, many of his contemporary reviewers were acutely concerned with, and even repulsed by, the artist's repeated and sustained use of the female nude in his art. There developed a strong suspicion, voiced by many in the period, that Etty's art was nothing more than a cynical attempt to corrupt the public. 
It was believed that the pleasing splendour of his richly coloured canvases were designed to dupe the gullible spectators, disguising the artist's underlying preoccupation with depraved sexual behaviour and titillating forms of bodily display. Etty was openly denounced as essentialist with a lascivious mind and was repeatedly encouraged to turn from his wicked ways and make his art fit for decent company. With the possible exception of Turner, no other British artist in the first half of the 19th century divided opinion more vehemently and consistently. Even today, Etty's art continues to court controversy. Many modern viewers remain shocked and repulsed by the artist's fleshy and voluptuous nudes, unsure as to whether they should celebrate or condemn the explicit reality of his figures. Indeed, despite the liberalisation of our society, it would seem that Etty's titillating female nudes remain, to this day, subjects of controversy. Hi, I'm Kerry Harker. I'm the exhibitions curator for Harwood House Trust, and I'm going to talk about Jacob Epstein. Jacob Epstein was one of the most controversial and now celebrated sculptors of the 20th century. Epstein arrived in Europe in 1902 from his native New York, where he was born to Jewish-Polish parents in 1880. He settled in London in 1905, where the British Museum's collections of non-Western art were a major formative influence. Epstein's relationship with the British public, press and art establishment was a stormy one from the start. Controversy found him almost immediately when he was commissioned in 1907 to produce a series of life-size figures for the new British Medical Association building on the Strand. Epstein carved a series of naked figures, unashamedly depicting various stages of human life, which immediately aroused a public storm of controversy and debate in the press. It was a pattern that was to repeat itself every time a major new public work was unveiled. Epstein was not to be deterred and the series of monumental carvings that he undertook during the 1930s and early 40s demonstrate his absolute conviction and commitment to his cause. I want to carve mountains, he claimed. Perhaps most controversial of all these sculptures was Adam, the huge carving of the progenitor of the human race that Epstein made in 1938-9 from a single block of Derbyshire alabaster. Into Adam, Epstein poured his interest in Old Testament themes, the poetry of Walt Whitman, and the influence of the non-Western art that he collected and so admired. The result is a powerful and challenging work that still has the power to shock, not least through the figure's prodigious reproductive organs, which Epstein endowed with a joyful movement and seeming life of their own. The sculpture has had a remarkable journey. Even the sculptor's own gallerists were originally reluctant to show it. But Adam achieved real notoriety when it was shown as a kind of curiosity during the 1939 summer season in Blackpool and later at Louis II Swords there in the 1950s. Adam seemed to stir up primitive passions in his viewers wherever he went and the question of obscenity dogged him. Finally rescued from Blackpool in 1960 by Lord Harwood, Adam eventually came to rest in the entrance hall at Harwood House in 1976 where he's been on display ever since. Epstein's career had a strange duality. Whilst caught in controversy through large-scale carvings, he had simultaneously forged a highly successful career as a prolific portrait modeller in bronze. Acceptance by the British establishment was finally signalled by a knighthood in 1954 and a late flurry of prestigious public commissions. But the heroic carvings of the 1930s are the works upon which Epstein's reputation as a giant of 20th century sculpture now largely rests, and from which his younger contemporaries such as Henry Moore drew such inspiration. Hello, I'm Sarah Staten. I'm an artist. I'm going to talk about Carl André. Carl André's 1966 sculpture, Equivalent 8, is one of a series of eight works composed from 120 bricks arranged in two layers on the floor in a 6 by 10 rectangle. This work was made and shown in New York City in 1966, with the remade fire brick version being acquired by the Tate Gallery six years later. The initial showings of this and the other two André works purchased at the same time went unremarked outside of art critical circles. However, in 1976, Equivalent 8 became notorious via a localised British media outing. 
The work was renamed by the tabloid press and in compliance with media-led shorthand, we all know the work now as the bricks, Carl Andre's bricks or tape bricks. This is, of course, not the first or last instance of an artwork becoming the focus of negative press attention. In the period since 1976, there's been a loss of innocence and media mediation is now a fully-fledged component of professionalised contemporary art. Andre worked in a different time and arena, and the Bricks episode was an occasion on which it was possible for a work of art to buck unwillingly into the limelight, to become an unexpected focus of public debate. This is also unusual as art scandals go, in that there was no objection to the work on the grounds of its subject matter. Previous and subsequent scandals have been more or less indistinguishable in their focus from a wider debate about censorship and public morality, the BRICS is one of a few such controversies where it was actually art, what it is and what it is not, that is in dispute. More precisely, the subject at issue is artistic value. André's work makes a point that is related to Duchamp's ready-mades, although there are marked differences of intention. You could say that while Duchamp's gesture is anti-art, Carl André's is pro-art. Duchamp put an ordinary humble object into an art gallery, saying that he had selected it for its lack of beauty, it was not an art object, and the gesture of placing it in a gallery was deliberately provocative, though not cynically provocative. He was interested in stimulating debate, rather than just causing a right fuss in the press. André's arrangement of bricks is an artwork made of everyday things, and the intention is that it be understood as such. It makes a claim about the transformative power of art, and as such, there is more alchemy than showmanship in it. Hello, I'm Simon Lewandowski, I'm an artist, and I'm going to talk about Damien Hirst. So what is it about Damien Hirst's work that keeps getting that controversial label? The controversy about his supposed plagiarism gets revived regularly. One recent article claimed to expose about 15 instances where Hirst has apparently stolen or copied ideas from other artists. For example, it claimed that putting things in cabinets plagiarises Joseph Cornell, which is a bit like accusing anyone who paints on canvas of plagiarising Rembrandt, really. When you look more closely, or indeed more widely, the supposed copying doesn't add up to anything more than all artists do. In fact, all culture advances through a process of imitating and altering. We see something we like the look of and have a go at it. Sometimes we think it's turned out better, sometimes not. Damien Hirst doesn't do anything that different from other artists. He just does it in the public eye and with more money at stake. Another controversy. Damien doesn't even make his own work. He has a whole company to do that. Of course, he's a brand now, a very 21st century thing. He makes very expensive things for very rich people, just the same as Cartier or Louis Vuitton or Rolex. Some of them are almost as ugly as the things Cartier, Louis Vuitton and Rolex make, and most of them are a lot more expensive. The handmade doesn't necessarily command the best prices. Controversy number three, he uses dead animals. As a carnivore, I find it very hard to get outraged by dead animals in tanks. I prefer bits of them on plates, or maybe made into a nice pair of shoes or a comfy armchair, but I can't see the line over which Damien Hurst apparently steps. Back in the early 90s, there did seem to be a streak of cruelty in his work. In the first iterations of his butterfly paintings, he released live butterflies into a gallery full of wet, sticky canvases on which the unfortunate creatures made a slow and unpleasant end when they tried to settle. Cruel as it was, it seemed exciting at the time, art straying into a darker, edgier place. Fortunately for the butterflies, now he uses them ready dead. What Hearst does do very well is to, metaphorically speaking, cut the business of art making in half and stick it in a tank so we can see all its bits. He's a bit like a stage magician who shows the audience the way he does his tricks. Where the controversy comes up again though is that maybe a lot of people don't really want to know how the tricks are done or how the art world works. They'd rather stick with the illusions. In the end, like Oscar Wilde said, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about and no artist would disagree with that. It has often been said that contemporary artists deliberately court controversy. The extent to which artists, writers and organisations contribute, comment or incite controversy is a matter of opinion. Though the importance of discussion and debate around artists' work, its exhibition and subsequent collection is vital to our understanding and engagement. Open debate and subsequent dialogue is relatively new in society and our ability to communicate, comment and form opinions is changing so fast that it will be a challenge for controversy and artists to keep up. For more information about the Art in Yorkshire supported by Tate programme, 
Download the Art Yorkshire app from the Apple App Store or visit art.yorkshire.com. Thank you for listening.